first of our joint committee meetings. I am joined by my colleague in the Senate, Senator Elizabeth Lachman, and we shall be talking about infrastructure as well as economic empowerment. We've also been joined by several of our colleagues who are on our various subcommittees, but I would be remiss if we did not take a moment and pause and just ask for peace in our nation. We ask for a shifting of the atmosphere and that we will be the example that we desire to see in our state and in our nation. Without further ado, I would like to give Senator Lockman an opportunity to give a few words. I wanted to share with you that this joint committee meeting is the, excuse me, the direct result of the African American Task Force that was brought together by the Delaware Legislative Black Caucus in conjunction with our Justice for All agenda. And we have created several subcommittees to help bring forth the work regarding economic justice, justice as it pertains to education, justice as it pertains to housing, and so many other topics. I would like to turn it over to Senator Lachman at this time before we get into the meat of this evening. Senator Lachman. Thank you so much, Representative Dorsey Walker. I'll be very brief, but good evening to everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. And I, I echo the representative's comments uh, that uh, we wanna open this meeting um, and listening session with um, you know just a fervent hope for for peace for for our nation um, so that we may continue to do this important uh, democratic work which is what we're here to do tonight um, I wanted to just um, point out that I am you know honored not only to serve as a state senator but to be a member of our Delaware Legislative Black Caucus which initiated the formation of the African American Task Force. Um, and we've had the great privilege to be able to uh, begin that work in recent months. And, uh, and I have the honor of chairing the um, Infrastructure and Environment Subcommittee, which has a particular focus on housing, which we'll be hearing about tonight. And I, I will be soon joined as co-chair of that subcommittee by uh, soon to be um, official Senator uh, Marie Pinckney. Um, we will be confirming our new colleagues in the coming week. Um, I also wanted to briefly recognize some of our other legislative colleagues before we, we move into the listening session and introduction of our moderator and panelists. Uh, we have with us tonight also Representative Medina Wilson-Anton. Um, I see also Representative Bill Bush, Representative Larry Lambert, uh, and Senator Sarah McBride with us as well. So thank you so much for, for being here with us for what we think is gonna be a really important conversation. And thank you so much to the panelists who are soon to be uh, introduced for being here to, to talk about such critical issues to black Delawareans um, and, and helping us to lay the groundwork for um, closing closing all of these gaps that had persist, persisted for so long. Um, and I look forward to hearing the conversation. So I'm gonna pass it back to Representative Dorsey Walker uh, to carry us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. And thank you for acknowledging our colleagues in the House and in the Senate. We are very blessed to have them as our partners in this important work. Again, I am Representative Sherry Dorsey Walker. I represent the third district right alongside Senator Lachman in the third. And I'm excited about this robust conversation that we shall have. And I chair the Economic Empowerment Subcommittee. At this moment, what I'd like to do is introduce our moderator for this evening, Ms. Alicia Clark. And I shall not be reading a resume. I called her and I let her know that I would speak from the heart. I have known Ms. Alicia for many years and she is indeed one of the individuals on whose shoulders we stand in our community. She has worked feverishly to bring about social justice, economic justice, and to empower our community. And she's one of the individuals who Senator Lachman and I can look at her and many others, Representative Wilson Anton, Senator McBride, and we can look at her as one of the women in the community and we consider her a wonder woman. It's a, it's a wonder, the work that she's able to do. And she worked feverishly in bringing about the issue of racism in state government. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to all of you, Ms. Alicia Clark. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative uh, Sherry Dorsey Walker for 
that very kind introduction. And, uh, and I appreciate the work that you and um, Senator uh, Lockman um, are, uh, are leading with this particular effort. So I thank you for the opportunity to um, be part of this robust and fruitful conversation this evening. I also want to thank the um, Legislative Black Caucus, the Delaware Black Caucus for the work that you're doing um, around a number of issues, um, this being one of them, but also health and welfare and law enforcement and looking at reforms um, in that uh, arena as well. And I also want to acknowledge the co-chairs of the task force, um, Representative Stephanie Bolden and Mr. Cleon Cawley for their leadership as well. So again, I thank you for the opportunity to be here and I look forward to um, having a, a really interesting conversation with um, this esteemed panel that you have assembled this evening. So do I just move on from here? Okay, very well, let's go. Yes, ma'am. So what I would like to do um, first is uh, make sure that uh, everyone is familiar with our STEAM panel. So I will um, introduce you. And, uh, and, and after the introductions, we will dive right into the, uh, the, 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 um, the discussion. We um, will cover as much as we can because we are limited with, with time. And there will be an opportunity for questions uh, and, uh, and comment at the seven o'clock hour, I believe, and Caitlin will lead the discussion um, at that point. So the first person that I would like to introduce is uh, Mr. Thomas Russell. Uh, Thomas Russell is an associate in the business practice group of Lewis, Brisboy, Bisgard, and Smith in Los Angeles, California. His practice focuses on the representation of sports and media franchises, professional athletes, entertainers, and companies in connection with general corporate and litigation matters. He happens to be a Delaware native, which is pleased, I'm pleased to hear that. Um, and he's a graduate of Sally's. So uh, I think we all are, are know, know where that is, as well as a uh, Howard University School of Law. So uh, we're pleased to, to have him with us this evening. Rustin Brown is a debt finance partner in the Washington DC office of Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, he handles legal matters involving complex financings of energy and infrastructure investments, which is really important for this conversation that we're having this evening. He is also a budding angel investor making recent investments in FlickShop and MP Power Financing and leading a 1.25, a 1.2 million friends and family round for Clean Boss Incorporated. Logan Henry, uh, a dear friend of mine. Logan is the CEO of Reach Riverside, Kingswood Community Center, and the warehouse. So Logan wears many, many hats, and we all know that he's wearing several hats. Um, Reach Riverside uh, um, is a nonprofit community development corporation created to lead the $250 million revitalization of the Riverside neighborhood. So it's an amazing, amazing project that uh, uh, Logan is uh, leading the efforts on and um, we're watching it uh, real time because the, uh, the team makes sure that information is shared with the, uh, with the community. So we're watching the, uh, the project as it progresses. Rashmi Reagan is the executive director of the Delaware Community Reinvestment Action Council, also known as DCRAC. And uh, she joined DCRAC in 1994 as its executive director and, and as the only staff which I didn't know, um, but it speaks to her tenacity and, uh, and just how committed she is to the issue of financial literacy and, uh, and economic opportunity for people of color. And in 2011, she led the effort to establish Stepping Stones Community Federal Credit Union, which also expanded services in 2019 to include, le include legal services. So we're glad to, to have Rashmi here as well. Deanna Sargent, 
currently serves as the Vice President of Community Development for Sinair Corporation, a nonprofit organization in Wilmington, Delaware, where she works to advance comprehensive community development objectives in Wilmington neighborhoods. And uh, if you are um, have the opportunity to, to participate in uh, community development um, um, forms or projects that are happening in our city, you will always see Deanna um, present. And uh, she uh, has really, um, I think, done a phenomenal job in terms of really being connected with the community at the uh, at the level where it, it really matters and, and makes sense. So we're glad to have her this evening. And finally, we have Vanetta Young, who is the founder of Vanetta Young Advisors, which is an investment readiness and fund formation organization. She helps emerging private equity and venture capital fund managers raise capital confidently and successfully. So as you can see, we have an awesome panel. They bring to the table a variety of uh, experience and expertise in a number of areas. And um, we all should uh, be very uh, thankful and appreciative of the uh, panel that's been assembled tonight to have this very um, robust conversation. So I'd like to, uh, I have a question. The um, Am I doing something wrong? The speaker view is, uh, let's see, let me make this change. Gallery view, okay, that's better. Okay, I needed to just make a change on my, on my system. So I'd like to uh, just, just start with a few opening remarks if, if, if you don't mind, and then we'll get right to the, uh, to the question. Racial economic inequality is deeply embedded throughout the US and profoundly impacts communities throughout the country. Evaluating the economic state of, of uh, Black America and more specifically Black Delawareans requires acknowledging that while the state of Delaware has made some progress, very large disparities continue to exist. So recognizing both the progress and the challenges is essential to ensuring that all Delawareans including Blacks and people of color, have a realistic chance to achieve economic parity. The data always tells us two different stories, with leading indicators of social and economic well-being showing that on average Black Americans face much more difficult circumstances than their white counterparts. The Economic Opportunity and Infrastructure and Environment Subcommittees have a goal of wealth building, and that's why we're here to talk this evening. The question is, how do we get there? As we know, COVID-19 has merely exposed the structural inequities that were already present. Black workers are bearing the brunt of the economic fallout, as well as the emotional and mental challenges this pandemic has caused. So as we know, this task force was created in June of 2020 to study and make recommendations regarding the inequities that Black Americans and Black Delawareans, or I should say Black Delawareans experience in our state. We should view 2020 as the year of revelations. And it is my hope that during this brief session tonight, we will have substantive discussions about the opportunities, the options, and the possibilities in front of us. So your insight and expertise are really important. And again, we wanna thank you for making time to be part of this event. So I wanna start with uh, talking about um, the role of community developers in development. And I think I'll start with Logan, um, Logan Herring, who is heading up, as I mentioned, the REACH Riverside Project. REACH stands for Redevelopment Education and Community Health. REACH Riverside um, is, uh, has launched a $250 million revitalization project. And I'd like to hear from, uh, Logan, in terms of the issues around residential segregation and gentrification. So how do you um, approach a project of this magnitude, um, uh, Logan, in a way that includes the community, um, ensures that people are not um, moved out of the, of, of the neighborhood and that there are um, opportunities um, not only for um, home ownership, but also for um, for business enterprises as well. 
Yeah, great question. I, I had a feeling you were going to call on me first. So thanks, Alicia, for allowing me uh, to be first up to bat. And um, I'm humbled to be on this panel with all of these great people that I see before me. And thank you to all the attendees um, that have tuned in this evening. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very complex um, situation. And uh, I appreciate everyone who has participated and contributed. I see some of our board members like Yana Sargent, who's on the Reach Riverside board, Representative Dorsey Walker, who is my board co-chair for the warehouse. Um, and with complex uh, issues and complex problems, we have to approach it with comprehensive and complex solutions and holistic solutions. And, and you just, you read the acronym for Reach Riverside, which stands for Redevelopment Education and Community Health. And it's a holistic approach, approach of how we look at things. And it's a three-pronged approach. And you know, to uh, immediately address your, your question and concerns about gentrification, displacement, um, everything that you know, we talk about with community development, um, there's two major things that I look at and that I tell people that allow us to uh, you know, hopefully aspirationally avoid um, displacement. The one is our ability to build on vacant land. Um, we're looking at a 600 uh, unit project and the first three phases of our housing will be built on vacant land. And as we prepare our residents and our neighbors to transition into those new homes, we are starting a new initiative this year called EMPOWER, which stands for Economic Mobility Places Ownership Within Everyone's Reach. In that initiative, we're investing a million dollars each year into customized economic mobility training and support for each family in the existing homes. The goal of our neighborhood is to have a mixed income community, a third market rate rental, a third affordable, and a third deeply subsidized with about 20% home ownership units. So in order to meet that mix, we can do it one of two ways. We can go out to the external community and invite that mix in, or we can build from the ground up and build within the community that exists now. And we believe that we should build within the community that we have now and invest in the human capital to match the physical capital. You see what has happened over the past year, you know, when we look and how fitting today, when we look at the, the importance that we put on the physical capital and we don't get anyone's attention as still buildings start burning down and those type of things. We believe that if we invest in the human capital to match the physical capital that we are investing in, which is $250 million, that we will have a successful mixed income community and we can be proud to say that we are not displacing or moving anyone out of the neighborhood. We believe in providing choices and at the end of the day, if they choose to move, that's one thing, but at the end of the day, we want to compete to have them stay. Thank you, Logan. Um, I, I want to follow up on um, a few things that you that you mentioned and go to Deanna, um, Sergeant, and uh, hi, Deanna. Deanna's my coalition sister as well. So how you doing? Good to see you again. Um, Deanna, can you speak to the um, community development, I guess, question in terms of, um, you know, the role that um, business enterprises, you know, play in, in this space? And, uh, and again, um, I didn't hear Logan mention it, so I'm going to come back to you as well, Logan, but I also want to, to hear from you in terms of how do we create opportunities for um, black owned businesses, black owned enterprises um, in, in that space as well. So home ownership, certainly there's a formula for how we get there, but, um, but, but where, uh, where, where are you focusing and what is your strategy and plan around um, you know, creating business opportunities as well? So I, I guess I'll ask, I'll ask Logan for you to, to uh, just um, comment briefly on that and then uh, go to Deanna in terms of talking about the, um, the, uh, the Sener and, and corporations and businesses in terms of their role in, in making these projects sort of come to life. Yeah, well, I'll provide the segue uh, to Deanna and perhaps Rashmi. Okay. Uh, we truly believe in partnerships and collaboration we understand we can't be everything to everybody, we can't do everything, but we can bring everybody to the table 
we operate under, and I know a lot of people have heard me say this, where everybody brings their best dish to the table. We understand that we can't do everything, but we can invite people like Diana and Rashmi and others that are on this um, in this meeting to uh, to work with us to make sure those opportunities are available in the neighborhood. As we work with our individual residents, uh, they can work with the business community, and then we can make sure to attract the right type of businesses that are supportive of the community. We currently have three dollar stores, Popeye's Chicken Corner stores. We're working to bring in a, a local grocer to provide access to healthy foods, making sure, as I said, with Empower to support the existing residents and families that they can become employed, um, record expungement, whatever they need to empower them to continue to strive and move up that economic ladder to the ultimate goal of home ownership should they choose. Um, but the importance is to have them be self-sufficient. So, uh, you know, I'll segue it and, and hand it off to Deanna um, for her to kind of fill in the gaps or the things that I didn't mention. Sure, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. And as always, it's great to see you, Alicia. Um, so I'll first just share a little bit about what we do at my organization, SENIR. We are a community development financial institution, better known as CDFI. Um, and we essentially serve as an intermediary between banks and the community um, to provide investments in very critical projects that are difficult to get done or considered risky. Um, and we take more time to invest in providing technical assistance and capacity building um, to organizations so that we can help move those projects forward. Um, we primarily provide lending and investment in affordable housing development projects, um, most that are uh, financed through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. And also um, we provide funding to support community facilities um, that cater to um, low and moderate income um, communities. So examples of community facilities are community centers, um, qualified healthcare centers, um, and other mixed use development projects. So um, there are other CDFIs that specifically focus on small business development that could speak more to that, um, but we do focus more so on affordable housing. Um, however, I will share in terms of creating more business enterprises um, as it relates to um, really helping to advance community revitalization initiatives. Our organization did see the need for more local developer capacity um, in communities in Wilmington that have not seen um, the levels of investment as seen on Market Street in the Central Business District and um, also the Riverfront. Um, so we decided to um, launch a program called Jumpstart Wilmington, which is actually modeled after a program in Philadelphia called Jumpstart Germantown, um, which is a local developer training program um, with the intent of getting people who are actually from the Wilmington community or are committed to developing the Wilmington community um, trained on the development process so that they better understand how to execute meaningful socially impactful development projects, um, again, in underserved communities so that we can get them more involved. And we see that as a vehicle for wealth building opportunities um, for those local small scale developers um, to create, we talk about creating businesses and creating wealth, also creating um, jobs and attracting investment into um, those communities as well. Um, so through this program, we see that as an opportunity to um, definitely um, support the creation or enhancement um, of business enterprises. Um, I will also say, again, um, as a CDFI, um, we really pride ourselves on providing um, technical assistance and capacity building that's paired with our loan products. So sometimes you may go to a bank and, you know, they go through the checklist, you don't meet the criteria. So it's a no, we can't provide you financing um, for, your, for your business or for your other development project. What we do is say, um, let's, let's walk with you and, and get you ready for, for this loan so that we can ultimately support your project. So it may not be a no, it's a no, not right now, but let us help you get to the point where we can provide access to capital to support your business or your development project, because that's one of the most critical things that's needed, um, especially in um, underserved communities, um, is having access to capital um, for various um, business and development projects. Right, right. So th thank you for that, um, Deanna. And I would just add, you know, real quickly, um, because I know we have to move on. 
um, I know we've talked about Wilmington. Can you speak to um, the the other parts of the state? You know what's happening in Kent County, what's happening in in uh, Sussex County as it relates to development initiatives or projects that Sanira is involved with. Yes, so um, I will share that in Wilmington, Wilmington is considered a priority city of ours. So uh, we are bringing a lot more resources um, to Wilmington. Um, however, our involvement throughout the state um, is, is still very much present. Um, and we do provide investment and lending to support primarily if, um, affordable housing development. Um, and we also provide um, loans to support um, the state's program, Downtown Development District Program, which facilitates economic development. Um, so we do, we are very much involved in affordable housing and economic development projects in Kent and Sussex County, County as well. Okay, so I was, you know, I know Dover is about 50%, what, 54% Black, you know, there's a, there's a large population of Black uh, and Brown people in the lower parts of the, of the state, there are fewer opportunities um, often, and, you know, outside of state government, the largest employer of, uh, of Black people are Black businesses. And so if mm -hmm. we look at the state and we see the, uh, the, the, um, the number um, in terms of Black enterprises, that number is, is not where I think any of us want it to be. You know, it really speaks to the need for there to be a more concerted effort to develop Black, black businesses, Black enterprises. Um, I want to move on and talk about um, infrastructure. We've got some experts on this, this uh, panel tonight who um, um, specialize in that area. And it's a really important um, I think uh, area for us to really begin to think about and, 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 uh, and focus on. We hear it all the time at the national level, infrastructure, infrastructure, and you know, um, developing um, uh, um, infrastructure or, or programs to support in infrastructure. And so I want to ask uh, Rustin, um, I think I'll start with Rustin and then um, maybe move on to um, Rashmi as well, but how do we incorporate provisions for, you know, sort of removing failing infrastructure um, and, and enabling new investment within state and local capital planning budgets. You know, what does that look like for, you know, the state of Delaware? What should we be doing um, as it relates to infrastructure development? And how does that tie in and create um, wealth opportunities for, um, you know, Black communities, Black Americans? Yeah, I, I think it goes a lot to what Logan and Diana spoke about earlier. It's you know creating partnerships. You know, there's you know public-private partnerships that you can see in a number of jurisdictions where you know the federal government will subsidize, or you know federal or state or local governments will subsidize projects um, so that they are more profitable for the private entities, and they they reduce some of the risk of the private entities that are making the investment because the private entities might not make that investment in a community where they might not see the same returns that they might find in a more affluent community. So the public side of that is, is providing the subsidies that are necessary to get the best operators into the partnership. And then also you know, utilizing the resources that you have in local communities um, and, and, and making these infrastructure projects part of the overall revitalization project. So with the, with the Riverside project, how do you, I, I've done work with a CDFI here in Washington, D.C. called City First Enterprises. Um, I worked on a pro bono basis with, with this organization, and we did two partnerships with the D.C. Green Bank and the Montgomery County Green Bank in, 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 in Maryland to provide resources and loans to solar panel uh, companies who are putting solar panels on affordable housing units. So you have a double whammy, right? You get clean energy that's affordable and it makes the cost of energy for the residents um, much lower and it reduces the, the environmental impact um, that other um, more you know, coal and, and natural gas and these other um, more environmentally draining uh, resources cost. So like you, you, you create systems that way where you, you have the whole infrastructure that's here in Delaware, you know, the CDFIs, the developers, 
the local contractors and develop and and, con and and construction people, the the people who do solar farms or fuel cell technology, and part of that public uh, private partnership should also involve you know you have to be careful from a legal standpoint of you know quotas and and things of that nature, um, but should have some allocation or at least some type of plus if there's a black business that's involved um, and not in a kind of, you know, there's just a black owner that's kind of a shell to get a government contract, but, you know, significant diligence into what is the representation of the, the partners that are, that are participating in these projects that the, that the state government and the local governments are providing. All right. Um, so, uh, Rashmi, I think I'm going to come, come to you, um, your home, home based in Delaware. And so you're very familiar with um, the challenges as well as, um, you know, where the opportunities lie. What are your thoughts around the, you know, sort of the work that needs to be done um, in terms of, of infrastructure and more specifically, how do, what, what do we need to do to ensure um, that community gets plugged into that conversation? And more specifically that um, black businesses and, you know, um, minority businesses of color get plugged into um, those opportunities. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, in terms of infrastructure, my experience from having a shop on Church Street during the time 495 was under construction was that we had such huge disruptions major traffic was diverted through a tiny little one lane traffic on Church Street. East side bore a huge brunt of disruption, but east side citizens did not get any benefits from being imposed on for over six months, almost a year. Right now, I-95 repair work has begun and it will disrupt our neighborhoods for a couple of years. We need to fight for community benefits. When we are adversely affected, we need to be compensated adequately. In terms of opportunities to take advantage of this, um, millions of dollars in repair work, there has to be a priority for minority businesses, women-run businesses, and there are systems in place to do so. However, we don't even have a good list at the state and local levels of who are the minority businesses that we reach out to to give them the opportunity to bid on particular projects. So there isn't much of a priority to make sure that our folk are there. For small businesses, there are other hurdles too. Access to capital, uh, access to credit, uh, access to bond. Uh, these become very, very expensive and um, insurmountable burdens many times to take advantage of these bidding opportunities. And of course, with the PPP loans, we experienced that so many businesses couldn't take advantage of these, this brilliant COVID relief opportunity that existed for our businesses, but our businesses couldn't benefit from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, thank you, Rashmi. Um, your point is is uh, is well taken. And as we think about um, the development projects, the infrastructure projects, you know, we have to look at things from a, um, a I think a comprehensive through a comprehensive lens, um, and and as well as the integration of ideas in terms of you know what this project uh, can mean for the the, the community and um, and others. Um, because there are very, I think, innovative things we can do and creative things we can do to ensure um, that there are benefits um, that um, uh, come from um, those, those, those projects. 
in investment and, and economic opportunity, I'm going to, to move to Benetta and, and Thomas. Um, and, and I'd like for you to talk about, um, you know, sort of the income inequality piece, uh, you know, how do we, because we're talking, you know, we've talked a little bit about the, the, the uh, need for business enterprises to be created. That's a way to, you know, generate and build wealth. Um, on an individual level, um, we know that the, uh, the um, you know, there are huge disparities in terms of uh, income inequality between whites and, and their counter, blacks and their white counterparts. So Vanetta and, and Thomas, in terms of the work that you do, um, can you please speak to, you know, how do we begin to address this income inequality in communities? Who needs to be at the table for those discussions? You know, what steps are necessary to start in terms of um, building wealth in, in Black families beyond home ownership? Because everyone always starts with the home ownership conversation. Yes, yes, okay, we know home ownership is important, um, but that's not the only vehicle and that's not the only um, um, way to sort of, you know, uh, address these issues around in income inequality. Can you speak to that? Yeah. And also, thank you very much for, for having us. I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, I think there's, you know, a, when it comes to addressing income inequality, you basically have to decide where you're going to start. Is it a matter of, you know, first of all, ensuring that you're educating um, that there's equality in the education system so that by the time that folks are going to college that, you know, there is a sense that their recruiting is going to be fair. Um, but I think, you know, there is that in deciding where to start, I think you do have a couple of options. And I think uh, Thomas can definitely speak more about the, the need for financial literacy programming. And that starts at a, a pretty young age, but I think there is also quite a bit of education that can be done um, at, I won't say older ages, or but there are at least ones that, you know, when you think financial, financial literacy programming, you might think elementary, middle school, but where, where is the opportunity for folks who are high school, college, and beyond that? So taking the education beyond, say, balancing a checkbook into what's the importance of contributing for, to a 401k plan. Um, much of the income inequality that's happening now is because the stock market has done extraordinarily well in spite of the economy being very, very shaky. So the rich have gotten much, much richer in a time when the poor have gotten much, much poorer. So there is that sense of you know, providing education, but also some sort of opportunity to give people to have that experience in the market. And I think the other part of that, uh, I would say a little bit higher level, is giving folks who already had this level of experience, Preston was talking about partnerships. So, you know, there are actually quite a few black and brown um, investment managers. So there's a, uh, the sense of uh, wealth managers, so folks who work with people individually to make sure that they're making good investment decisions. So are people educated about the wealth managers in the area who are people of color? And even more than that, on an institutional level, there are uh, people of color who run investment funds, like the folks that I work with, who are starting private equity and venture capital funds. Um, Oftentimes, these folks have a really difficult time when they're going to institutions such as, you know, state and local pensions to, to get funding to invest largely in businesses that are owned by people of color. Uh, there's a, a sort of a quip in the industry that people invest in people who look like them. And that's part of the reason why people of color don't get invested in as much. So if you can put pressure on pension plans to, you know, redefine what it is that they're frankly, in my opinion, afraid of and say, okay, it's actually now time to start investing in these managers of color so that they can start investing in, in black and brown businesses to start producing the cycle of wealth creation there. That's great. And, and one, one thing, Thomas, before you, before you chime in, Benetta, can you speak to, you know, who's doing this and doing it well? Are there any, you know, best practices out there? Are there any flagship um, you know, sort of cities or, or um, states that are really um, doing, you know, an exceptional job at um, engaging Black wealth management firms and companies and doing some really innovative things. 
That's an excellent question. The cynic in me is saying, hmm, exceptional is kind of a, that's a strong, wow. qual strong qualifier <laughs> to use these. We're, we're starting, <laughs> starting to do a good job. <laughs> um, but I think about states like Illinois, um, the IMRF, for example, the uh, Illinois Municipal Retirement Fund has a mandate to use uh, a certain amount of minority and women-owned uh, investment manager, uh, particularly in their private equity and venture capital allocation. So I think um, states like Illinois are doing really interesting things and providing opportunity, but I do always think that there could be more done. Great, thank you. Thomas. Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for having me here today. Um, but <clears throat> to answer your question, one of the important things that I, I found is that uh, education and just access to knowledge is key to closing the gap in the, the economic and in inequalities uh, between blacks and whites in, in Delaware. Um, growing up there, I noticed that I just never had these type of conversations about wealth management, wealth building, wealth passing, uh, generational, you know, wealth uh, being passed along. Um, so as Vanetta was saying, one of the key things I think we need to do is, you know, start venturing out into the communities. It sounds like uh, from hearing everyone else on the panel that we're, we're already in the communities in various forms, but a, a piece that we could add to that is not only financial literacy, but um, through the partnerships Rustin and Veneto were speaking to, um, having individuals come in and speak about some of these high level issues. That's an easy way to have uh, people that are young and people that are um, a little bit more established in their careers and their, in their money to um, learn more. Um, you know, as with everything, if you, if, if you know better, you'll do better. So um, the, the key piece for me is going into our local police athletic leagues and boys and girls clubs and having a set time where individuals could come in and you know, send their kids or send, send themselves um, to sit down and, and, and to get this knowledge. It, it doesn't have to be as simple as balancing a checkbook. If it needs to be that simple, then of course you know, it can be done. However, um, just having access to people like Rustin and Vanetta and myself who you know, deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, I think more individuals will be able to one, uh, realize what they don't know and two, start implementing it in their own lives um, so that they can close that gap. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, I always think about when, you know, Rustin and Vanetta and I are, are doing our, our investments is it doesn't have to be the most money in, in the world. You know, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, $600,000 to invest. Uh, if, if you got 2000 just get started, you know? Um, once you have the knowledge and you get started, it, it becomes becomes kind of addicting. You know, you want to just do it again, um, and you know. So I think the more the more information we provide the people and actually take it to them, not not just say come come some far place that you can't reach, bring it to them and and and, and let them and let them you know digest it and and, and learn the information. And I, I I I think we will see that more people are involved. And that that gap starts closing a lot a lot quicker. So so to that point, let me ask you, you this question. So what infrastructure needs to be created to help the infrastructure? <laughs> yeah. So I don't even think the infrastructure needs to be created. You know, Rustin and I and Danetta and I talk often about how we already have the tools. We just have to start putting them in place. Um, uh, if you know, we could take it from you know bottom to top. You know, bottom. Where will we do this? Well, we have all these community centers in Delaware. I'm a product of them. So, you know, we can start there. Second, we, we're, we're in the corporate state. So we have access to some of the, the biggest and largest financial institutions, the Tony Islands of the world that can come in and speak to these issues. Um, you know, now with, you know, Rustin and Vanetta and I being on board, you have access to other wealth managers and fund managers that, that would be more than happy. You know, one of the things I know we often find in our line of work is that you know, the people that are doing this work often sometimes don't even know other people are interested in hearing about it. So, um, you know, th that's where the partnership piece comes in and allows us to come into to these community centers or, you know, wherever in the community to, to provide the information. And then finally, um, actually creating a project for everyone to invest in so that it can be done the first time. And so that next time when that mom or that single parent decides, hey, I want to take my $500 and, and, and put it here, 
she can do it on her own and she doesn't need a wrestling or Veneta to, to be there to coach her through it because she's already learned the information. Um, so, you know, that kind of three tier approach, I think is, is the best way to kind of yield those results and, and, and provide the infrastructure because it's already there. You just need to tap into it um, and, and get everyone to partner, so. Well, let me, well, let me throw that question to, to, uh, to Rajmi. Thank you for your, 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 your comment, B, um, um, Thomas, because Rashmi um, is, is sort of in this, in this space. Um, and I'd like to hear from you, Rashmi, in terms of, you know, what do you think is needed to, to sort of jumpstart this type of engagement um, and activity around wealth creation, because, um, you know, black, the black community is not a monolithic community. You have people who are doing well, <laughs> you know, you have people who are, in, you know, in the middle class or, or those who are looking to, you know, expand their, their businesses or, or, you know, um, do better around savings and things of that nature. And so, you know, what do you, do you think Rashmi is, is missing in terms of, uh, you know, how creating that type of, um, you know, I don't know, go to place, go to institutions so that people can get connected um, and they can receive the type of assistance and support to, you know, build and create wealth. Thank you, Alicia. And I know, Rustin, you want to say something. So uh, I'll say a few words and turn it over to you. Bonetta okay. said something that people want to do business with people who look like themselves. And what unfortunately happens when you open the yellow pages or you look around the ads, you don't see people who look like you. So you hold on to because you are afraid. I'm reminded of a long time ago, 33 years ago, I was an intern at DCREC. I came to one of the board meetings one of my board members came to that meeting dressed in a suit and another board member was just painting his house. So he came to the meeting dressed in his sweats and that was covered with paint chips on him. And the difference was one had to stop at a bank and she needed to look good so she could be treated well. It's not changed in 33 years. For me, with the money school that we run, I am going to rope Tom, Rustin, Vanetta to be these volunteer instructors. The more our uh, clients see and hear from you, the more they realize, yes, I can do it. I don't need those thousands of dollars to begin investing. I also am worried because COVID-19 impacted the black and brown communities very harshly. So the wealth that was built has been stripped away and stripped down significantly just from survival. And the reasons are very many. When 2021, when they sit down to do the taxes, many of our black and brown families are in for a rude shock. Normally, they wait for that big refund and they plan their financial lives around it. But now they are not only not going to get a refund because they received an unemployment insurance check, they will owe a tax debt. They have probably, and it's not something just in the last 12 months, but for years, the toxic credit, toxic Debt, the payday loans, the title loans that flood our communities have had such a horrendous impact on the credit report. With a lousy credit report, when we talk income equality, how can you get, you can't even get a job. Then we have, we allow thousands of percent APR. We need a 36% APR rate cap in our state period. So let me ask you this, Rashmi. So, how, so, so can some of these issues be addressed through policy or? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I mean, so we have to speak out and this is a great platform where 
I have so many years listening to us. We need a rate cap. We need to ban the box. I mean, our people are put behind bars for non-payment of a traffic ticket. I mean, yeah. and, and I think- Doesn't make you, sense. Yeah, you raise a great point because there are impediments and barriers to um, getting on the right track. And, uh, and I think that what is absolutely important is that, you know, this conversation not be approached from a very, you know, sort of a linear and narrow perspective in terms of it's just, it's just about people having money to put in a savings account. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all these other um, sort of ancillary um, issues that, um, that create the impediments and the barriers to establishing wealth or creating a business and, and, and things of that nature. And we certainly won't be able to cover everything here tonight, but I hope this at least starts the conversation so that there's a deeper dive around that particular issue. I wanted to touch on one, one other thing, and I know that the hour is winding down, um, and I wanted to have the, you know, the panel to speak to this in terms of the, the environment, because this is important. So we talked a little bit about infrastructure, but um, how do we balance sort of in, environmental health risk with infrastructure development? Because the infrastructure development is really important. It can create jobs and business opportunities and things of that nature. But we also know, and Rashmi touched on this earlier, when you have those big sort of infrastructure projects coming into communities, you know, sometimes there are these unintended consequences and, and the community becomes the collateral damage in the process. So how do we, you know, how do we balance the environmental health risks with in infrastructure development to preserve, you know, affordability, of course, and also protect the people um, in, in those communities. And I'm gonna throw that to, uh, I guess, to, to Rust and, and, um, and Deanna also, and Logan, because you're in the middle of it right now. Yeah, I, I think first thing is is doing infrastructure that's based on you know practices that are environmentally safe, and you know, and I think there's a lot of new technology. There are you know upstart companies who are who are disrupting kind of the larger companies in the way things used to be done, and so I think that's one of the benefits of where we are now. And a lot of these issues that we address, the payday lenders, you know, fintech is a major thing that's you know, changing and disrupting the, the toxic issues of, you know, black and brown people not having enough money for a deposit account, so they can't get free checking. And so they have to go to a payday lender to ca even cash a check, you know, and that's a 30% tax that's uh, unaccounted for just by, you know, wanting to cash a paycheck. You know, I know plenty of people and, you know, including my cousin who's starting a company called Mocafy or started a company, and he's partnered with MasterCard to help these practices and help CDFIs, you know, CDFIs are economic infrastructure. You know, City First uh, Enterprise that I mentioned, while PPP has been slow, in six weeks, they helped get out $5 million in DC in six weeks to 1,300 small businesses because the CDFIs are nimble, they have technology, they're not constrained by regulations um, that the larger banks are constrained by. And so it, it's about coming up with creative ways and it, and it requires the legislators to look at how regulations impact creativity and innovation, right? There, there's a need for, for regulation to protect against the sanctity of these, these systems, but regulation could also sometimes be a detriment to innovation. And so striking that right balance um, and finding ways that, that are creatively incentivizing people who are taking risk, but calculated risk to help improve dynamics moving forward. Thank you. Diana. So just to clarify your question, when you say environmental risk, are you talking about environmental contamination? Is that included in your oh, question? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, I mean, that, that, that's really challenging, but it's a very important um, topic of conversation. Um, what comes to mind um, to me is um, putting policies in place that um, prevent um, negative health impacts um, as it results from development. 
Um, an example um, that I thought about was in Northern Pennsylvania with the Marcellus Shell and um, the uh, drilling that took place. Um, there were certain policies in place that assessed impact fees um, when, whenever um, there was a, a negative impact as a result to drilling. And so those impact fees went to the community to counteract um, the damage that was done. So um, from an environmental health um, and risk standpoint, I think we have to think about that when we um, uh, start to develop projects that could uh, yield those negative results. Thank you, Deanna. So policy again. <laughs> Logan? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing we were uh, told early on in this process and working with purposeful communities by um, the president and CEO Carol Norton was to get ahead of our success, understanding that in years to come, the uh, property value will rise in the Riverside Northeast Wilmington community. And how do we make sure that through the success, um, to no fault of our own, that the community has been pushed out by rising taxes and things like that. So, you know, keeping that in mind, um, considering how we work with the city and other municipalities on tax abatements, how we uh, include through the development, um, you know, the, the community and, and get their ear to things and what they want um, as we develop the community so they ultimately can benefit. And then the, how they contribute um, to everything that's going on through the construction over the next three years uninterrupted because we've received back-to-back 9% -back um, low-income housing tax credit awards we should have over at least, I think, 100 to 130 jobs created um, that will be sustained over a three-year period. So how does the community ultimately benefit from that and have access and opportunity to those jobs and be upskilled to uh, you know, compete um, for those opportunities? The, the contracts on the, um, you know, the construction and those type of things. So that's what we're focused on is how does the community ultimately benefit? And I just wanted to touch quickly on what you talked about and what all you talked about in terms of wealth management and financial literacy. And I just wanted to state that, you know, right now the Riverside neighborhood, the, the vast majority, if not all of the community members and families, the, um, the average income, annual income was less than $10,000. When you're in survival mode, when you're poor, when you don't have money, it's about basic needs first. It's about, you know, can I feed my family? Then it's, can I feed my family healthy food? Uh, you know, can I pay my bills on time? Will I have a job? Can I get childcare? Um, do I have transportation? Do I have access to healthcare? Uh, access to technology, continuing education, access to, to uh, quality education. All the things that we really stepped into the gap during this, during the, uh, the pandemic with our relief fund, we've raised $500,000 and put out $285,000 in direct cash to all of the families where each family received $250 over a five month period. Shout out to my brother, um, Markevis Gideon, who I think is, is one of our attendees. Um, and through work with Markevis, we put out over 400 Chromebooks mm -hmm. and uh, just struck a deal with him and Tech Impact to do another 600, uh, you know, 15,000 meals throughout the pandemic. So, you know, when we talk about, sometimes we're up here at the 30,000, 50,000, but level, but understanding that people right now are in survival mode. So sometimes, yes, we do need, do need to put a Band-Aid on the current wounds, but we also have to think about the future and work upstream, um, as I think uh, Manetta said earlier, um, focusing on the younger kids and, and the future generations as well. So as we put Band-Aids on the, the issues now, we build bricks that will turn into the foundation for the future. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Logan. Very, very well said and stated. And I, I'd like to just add to that, you know, economic development and community development are not mutually exclusive. They have to be, it has to be an integrated approach. Um, and when we begin to do that um, in a more coordinated and consistent fashion, then we'll begin to see some of these issues addressed. We are uh, winding down our time together. I would like for each panelist to just give a few um, brief closing remarks as we move into our um, our Q&A um, um, timeframe. So Logan, I'll, I'll start with you since you're up. Uh, I'm excited for what 2021 um, has in store for us. Um, I think that, you know, we need to figure out a way to leverage the relationships that we have. We have U.S. Senators. We have our Congresswoman. Uh, we have everyone knows Joe Biden by first name. I mean, we now have the uh, in, in 
you know, not to get political, um, but I think some things have been done in the past 24 hours that should prove favorable. We need to start looking at national money. Uh, often because of Delaware and the small population, we get the minimal in terms of allocation of resources. And we need to figure out creative ways to bring more resources to the state. And we need to do a better job, quite honestly, of the resources that we have currently to make sure that we're prioritizing them in neighborhoods and communities like Riverside and other communities around the city and state that truly do need the money and stop putting money where money already is. Thank you. Rustin? Yeah, I, I'm excited about 2021. I think there's a lot of things that were shaken up by COVID. It revealed, you know, it shined a light on a lot of dark areas. Um, so while the devastation of COVID has been terrible, um, I think it's really allowed for the world to see and particularly governments to see where are the places that aren't getting the resources, even though we know there's lots of resources that are going around. Um, and so how do we focus uh, proactively and, and constructively on getting the resources in the right places and creating proofs of concept? So, you know, this Reach Riverside, I'm hearing about it for the first time. That's a proof of concept that once done successfully with all the support of the people on this call can be modeled and taken to each and every community and be modeled not only here in Delaware, but in other communities around the country. And that's how you get the attention of the national government saying, hey, we want to invest in, you know, these communities and, and these new um, ways of doing what has not been done in the past. Thank you. Deanna? So I have a few things. I'll try to be very quick. Um, so the first thing is community development. And we have to remember that the community development starts with the community. So we have to continue to make sure that residents are involved in the process and that their voices are heard. Um, we heard policy a lot. Um, advocacy is very important. And I think um, equipping our community with advocacy tools so that they can advocate for policies and legislation um, that help um, advance them and also um, uh, decrease the, the wealth divide um, is, is extremely um, important. Um, we, policy is what we talked about residential and racial segregation. Policy is what got us here and policy is what needs to get us out. And so that's very important. Um, comprehensive, we talked about comprehensive solutions and holistic approaches. Um, we, we discussed that a lot of these issues are very interconnected and so we can't be afraid to um, look at things comprehensively and, and come up with um, comprehensive solutions to solve these um, complex problems. And lastly, I just wanted to make a note about gentrification versus displacement. I think we need to talk more about some of the nuances between those two words. Um, I think gentrification is not all that a bad thing. Uh, we talked about creating mixed income communities and I think that that's good for our neighborhoods because we want people from different income levels to be able to benefit from opportunities. It's the displacement that we need to work to protect and Logan talked about this and looking at again policies that we can put in place to make sure that when um, these neighborhoods are improved that everyone gets to benefit from them and no one is displaced. So we have to sort of reimagine the word gentrification and focus more on making sure that displacement doesn't occur once we see communities um, being improved. Thank you. Thomas? Thank you. Um, my closing remarks are pretty brief. Um, the thing I'm looking forward to most about 2021 that I think started in 2020 is the awakening and the empowerment of the people. Um, I think through this experience, specifically speaking to uh, closing the in, uh, economic inequality gap, um, you know, the more people, the more the more people realize their their power, and the more the more the people in Delaware realize that you know there are some things we we may not know at this time, but you know, given the partnerships and 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 that you know some people on this panel can bring to 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 citizens in Delaware, as well as the education that uh, we can bring as well. I'm excited to see the people start to awake and, and realize and learn things that they did not know and start to change the lives of those and um, for themselves and those around them. Um, you know, 
you know, education is a big part of my life. Um, it, it changed my world. It, it, it got me to where I am now. Um, so I'm, I'm always in, uh, in, encouraged and excited to see uh, what awakening, educational awakening can do for others. So I think, you know, as we start to implement some of the, the plans that we've been talking about for a few weeks now on closing that economic gap, um, I'm just excited to see what, what that proof of concept looks like and, and it being a success that, you know, people go share it with others. So that's, that's my, my, my thoughts for 2021. Zanetta? Thank you again for having me. And I think Logan made a very, very good point in stating that there are a lot of people who are in survival mode right now. And if there's one thing that I know as someone who was in survival mode for quite a bit growing up is that that produces a lot of creativity. And so I don't want to say that, you know, I'm looking forward to opportunity out of misfortune, but that's exactly what I'm looking forward to. Folks getting really, really creative about you know, how we can make progress for ourselves. And I think there is definitely an opportunity to bridge this divide, even in the Black community, with Black folks who are doing particularly well, finding ways to invest in these communities like the ones that uh, Logan was talking about. So, you know, obviously, people helping other people, but framing it in such a way that it is absolutely a win-win situation, and it's not presented as a charity case, because I think this is a time when we're all looking for new levels of hope and dignity. And so I look forward to seeing that come to pass in 2021. Thank you. Rashmi. Thank you so much. And picking up from the hope and dignity, beautifully said, we need to remove barriers. And there are tremendous policy barriers. We talk about rising tide, lifting all boats. But for our community, it is almost like it's dragging them down, pinning them down. It's a huge weight. Uh, and as an example, state of Delaware, it has a statute of limitation on tax debt collection that is 40 years long. So if you owe tax debts in the state to the state, got to pay it or else you're gone. So we've got to remove those barriers. We have to figure out ways to circulate the dollar in the black and brown communities longer than just mere six hours. Our black and brown communities aren't just about liquor stores, corner stores, and barber shops. There's so much more in our communities, but lenders don't get it. Nobody gets it. Uh, support the uh, CDFIs. We are talking about uh, supporting black owned businesses, support them, support also the only certified minority financial depository institution in the state of Delaware. And that is Stepping Stones Community Federal Credit Union. Even though it's only city of Wilmington right now, soon it'll be Newcastle and pretty soon it'll be statewide. We need to also work very hard again policy wise to stop wealth stripping. Once we build wealth, it gets stolen away from us and the scammers get put behind bars, but we are left holding the bag. We need to also engage. We need to engage the advocacy community, nonprofit community, foundations, governments, and with an overwhelming majority, the people who are actually impacted we need to be listening to what they have to say because what do we know about what challenges they face on a day-to-day -day basis? So I'm looking forward to collaboration, but if we have to build back better, we better build back better, can't do the same old, same old that we have done all in all our years in the past. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, your participation this evening. And um, although we, we had a short amount of time, I think we covered quite a few um, um, areas that are really important to this committee. And um, as they move forward in, in, um, in the work that they're going to be um, engaged with, you know, the gaps that we talked about are the result of decades of underinvestment 
and exploitation in communities of color. And, uh, and they also represent a much more direct legacy of harm and deliberate racial and economic exclusion. So I always, you know, um, believe that you should never waste a crisis. <laughs> and so we're at this point where we need to, um, and I think Vanetta said, take, you know, take advantage of the opportunity here to address these structural inequalities. And so now, you know, the ball is in the court of our state and local um, officials. And um, the community certainly needs to play a role, can play a role, and, um, and hopefully the advocacy that so many have talked about um, can be mobilized to move the policymakers in the direction where we need them to go. So I thank you for the opportunity to be part of this um, important discussion this evening, and I will turn it over to Caitlin at this point. Thank you so much, Alicia. Um, Good evening, everybody. We are now in the public comment portion of this meeting. Um, first, however, I do want to acknowledge um, that uh, a few other legislators joined our meeting, um, as well as some of our African American task force members and subcommittee members. So particularly, I'd like to give a shout out to um, Representative uh, Melissa Minor Brown. She had joined us earlier. Um, looks like she may have dropped off by now. Um, but we are also joined by Charlie Weatherspoon, Dana Cobb, Director Anas Ben Adi of the Delaware State Housing Authority, Eunice Guamesia, Marlena Gibson. Um, just going through my list, it's a long list. Uh, Secretary Sean Garvin um, of DENREC. Uh, and our state treasurer, Colleen Davis. So all of these folks are part of the African American Task Force or its subcommittee. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you to Alicia and our panelists for the robust discussion. Um, we did receive one question in the Q&A function. So I would like to start with that and then I'll open it up to um, comment. So this question is from Kevin Coleman. He asked um, Diana, how do you develop viable tools to help the community to become aware of policies that impact them negatively while giving them a consistent feedback loop to shape future policy that can drive positive change? Um, if you need me to repeat that, I'm glad to do that. I, I think I have it. Um, that's a good question, um, Kevin. One, I'll say, particularly for Wilmington and throughout Delaware, there are civic engagement programs that um, are currently in place um, that people could become a part of to learn how to advocate, to learn um, how to research legislation, um, and to learn how to act actively involve and get involved um, with their, their legislators. So I would start there. Um, in terms of tools, I, I think the tools are already there, um, in, in my opinion. Um, you have uh, civic and civic associations that you could become a part of, um, and you could also attend your city council meetings or your, your county council meetings to um, get more familiar with um, the legislation that's being um, posted on the agenda, um, understand what the opposition is, um, understand how it will um, impact you, be it positively or, or negatively. Um, so I think the, the tools are there um, for people to get actively involved um, in, in advocacy work and legislation. Um, it's really about um, you know, reviewing the legislation, understanding it, and, and really getting, um, getting in contact with your legislators and also um, holding them um, accountable. Um, and you can also, we talked a lot about partnerships, um, reach out to other groups um, that could help support um, um, certain legislation that you're either opposed or in support of. Um, there's power in numbers um, and start to mobilize and, and, and advocate around, around that. Um, so I think the tools are there. I think it's just about finding the networks to get plugged in. Um, where you can really create a force and, and an army to affect change. 
Thank you so much. Um, I already see that there are some hands raised on our attendee list. Um, I do want to give everybody an opportunity to give comment, um, but if everybody on the attendee list wanted to give a comment, we would certainly have to um, limit the amount of time. So I would like to limit comments um, to 90 seconds. Um, so we will start with um, Sierra Bryant. I'm going to unmute you now. And you have 90 seconds. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sierra Bryan, and I'm actually speaking on behalf of the Delaware Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Um, and I first just wanted to thank you all for the amazing input that you provided. Um, I especially appreciate it, Reach Riverside's program to place home ownership and back into our communities. Um, and considering the lack of affordable housing that is currently in Delaware, I think that's very important. Um, and that can make a huge impact on um, wealth and finances. Um, and so I also wanted to touch on how important wealth building is to economic justice as a whole, um, because it does actually um, help in many areas um, that most people may not expect. So for example, domestic violence, uh, we do know that that disproportionately affects black people um, and people of color because it targets those risk factors like low economic support and resources that do often influence um, domestic violence. And so I just add, wanted to add that piece in there as well. And thank you all again. Thank you so much, Sierra. If anybody else would like to give public comment at this time, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. And I will do my best to call on folks in the order that they raise their hand. I'm not seeing any raised hands. I'm hoping folks are, are able to find that function on Zoom. And if there are no other questions or comments, then I would um, defer back to our subcommittee chairs, um, Senator Lockman, uh, Representative Dorsey Walker, and Senator Pinkney. Senator Pinkney, would you like to go first? Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to start by thanking all of our amazing panelists this evening. This conversation was necessary, timely, and informative. So I thank you for taking the time out on this most bizarre evening to talk about things that are really, really impacting our communities on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you gave us takeaways, you gave us as legislators places where we need to pick up and keep going. And for that, I thank you. Um, I look forward to continuing these conversations for these listening sessions to continue through the African-American Task Force and the work of the uh, Black Caucus. And I invite everyone to continue to join us and continue to make sure that we have places where our voices are heard, the needs of our communities are elevated. Um, again, thank you all. Thank you to our colleagues who joined us this evening and let's get to work. It's hard to say much more than that. Um, I, I, I share Senator Pinckney's uh, sentiments. I'm very thankful to all of the panelists and um, your insights were, were, you know, a, a lot to absorb. So I can understand why, why folks necessarily have a lot of questions at the point. You gave us a lot to work with. And um, I look forward to having more of these conversations. Um, and, and seeing the types of, of questions and suggestions we get from the public um, in the wake of this session. So um, just really thankful to you and thankful for everyone again who took time out um, during this time to participate with us and, and think through uh, where we can go from here. So looking forward to more and looking forward to the work uh, that we can do for Delaware um, on, the, on the basis of some of the things that we touched on tonight. Thank you, Senators Pinckney and Senators Lockman. 
your partnership and this work is greatly appreciated. And again, I know that our colleagues have already been thanked, but I would like to thank Representative Bill Bush as well as Representative Larry Lambert, Representative Medina Wilson Anton. I'm trying to go from memory, Senator McBride and Representative Melissa Minor Brown, who did join us. Prayerfully, I have everyone. Yes, okay. And just really quickly to our subcommittee members, I would like to just say thank you for a job well done. I would like to take a moment and thank Ms. Caitlin Del Calo because this actually was the brainchild of Ms. Del Calo. Excuse me, Senator Lockman and I were talking about what we could potentially do. And Ms. Del Calo said, well, let's do a joint listening session. So thank you for a job well done in organizing and to our staff for working with you. I would like to thank Ms. Sianna Green as well as Ms. Vanessa and all the work that's gone into bringing about what needs to happen. Representative Bill Bush did share with me that there is a bill that's being circulated by Representative Ed Ozensky to eliminate the tax on unemployment benefits at the state level. And it was brought to my attention that it's also supposed to be taking place at the federal level once we get beyond some of the unsavory behaviors that are currently taking place. It is my hope that I can actually almost assure you that our congressional delegation will be working feverishly on it. Again, I would like to just thank everyone for joining us and for working feverishly to bring about the necessary changes in our state and to Miss Alicia, our outstanding, phenomenal. I told you she was a wonder woman too, Miss Alicia, who was our outstanding moderator. Thank you. You always come through for our community and to all the panelists. I don't know that we could thank you enough for the information that you've shared, for your willingness to share your knowledge and for your willingness to work together. So on this note, we shall, I shall end on this note. We can do more together than we can apart. So may God bless you and keep you. Absolutely, have a great night, everyone. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone. I would like to remind any attendees who are still on that we are always accepting public comment at African American Task Force at Delaware.gov. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks, everyone. Madam Treasurer, thank you. Madam Treasurer, I missed you.